in this episode of Influencers, Gina Raimondo, U.S. Secretary of Commerce. The President has been very clear with us, we have to use every tool in our toolbox to help the American people and reduce inflation. We can't make nothing in America. You know, it's just, we have to, it's the, the balance is out of whack. We've taken our eye off the ball. To be a strong, vibrant, global power, we need a strong, vibrant, advanced manufacturing uh, industry in the United States of America. I really believe 20, 30 years from now, when we look back, or maybe even 10 years from now, when we look back at COVID and we look at what are all the lasting negative impacts, the biggest one will be um, what happened to our kids. Hello everyone and welcome to Influencers. I'm Andy Serwer and welcome to our guest, U.S. Secretary of Commerce, Gina Raimondo, here at the uh, Department of Commerce. Secretary Raimondo, great to see you. Thanks so much for taking the time to speak with us. Thank you. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. I want to jump right in and ask you about chips and the semiconductor shortage. I know this is top of mind for you. And understand where things are, but also to sort of ask you about the connection between the shortages of chips and these reports of very high inflation that we've seen lately. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. So, there's a direct correlation. I mean, the inflation numbers came out yesterday. And, uh, you know, higher, I think, than anybody would want to see. But if you, did, if you get under the covers of the numbers, you realize that a third of the increase in inflation is due to car prices. Hmm which is stunning, you know, a third is due to car prices. Why is that? Because, la you know, last year, auto production of cars was down by almost 8 million cars, 7.7 .7 million cars. So supply is down, prices of cars are up 20%, and the, the reason, like the single reason or biggest reason that car production is down so much is because car companies can't get their hands on enough chips. And, and they will tell you that. If you, if you go to uh, production facilities of cars and trucks, by the way, you will see many, many cars fully assembled but for chips. So it's pretty simple supply and demand. You know, I'm thinking back to X10, which I took 30 years ago. It's like we need to increase the supply of cars, so prices will come down. And in order to do that, we need increase in uh, semiconductor chips. So there's really a direct link between the two, and we need Congress to act so they can fix the problem. And so there is the CHIPS Act out there, and I'm wondering where that stands right now and then how that would address this problem. Yeah. So it's kind of stalled in Congress, um, to be very honest, that the Senate worked hard got the CHIPS Act passed, uh, I think last summer, and it's been um, a little bit stuck in the House. Speaker says she's for it, I mean, she does support it, but it, we need to move it. And so why does it matter? It is, essentially, it's, um, it's uh, incentives that uh, the Commerce Department could provide to chips manufacturers so they will make chips in America. Um, if you ever, you know, have time for kind of a really scary read, you should learn more about how dependent the United States is on other countries, especially Taiwan, for our supply of semiconductors. Like right now in the United States, we make zero, none of the most sophisticated semiconductor chips, none of them. And we get the majority from Taiwan. So apart from the fact that we need to make chips in America so we can make more cars, reduce inflation, create jobs, it's a national security issue as well. We cannot be a secure nation economically or you know, nationally secure if we get 60, 70% of all of our chips from a single company in Taiwan. So in any event, Congress needs to move. They need to take action now. Uh, it'll send money to the Commerce Department. We'll set up a program here where we work in partnership with semiconductor companies, asking them to set up shop in America, making chips in America. 
And so would this bill then prospectively help NVIDIA, AMD, Intel, Micron, those U.S. companies set up fabs here in the United States, which you know cost a billion dollars. They're very expensive. Yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah. also, would it, would there be money for foreign companies as well, say like Taiwan Semiconductor, to build facilities here? Yeah. So yes and yes. Mm -hmm. uh, yes and yes. We need. Um, they cost many billions of dollars, as you said. I'm dating myself. I, yeah. I remember when they cost a billion. Yeah. It costs a lot more than that. Right? <laughs> yeah. It's uh, multiple billions of dollars. And look, th these companies could be building more fabs, or fab is just a word for a semiconductor facility where they make chips. They could build them now in Malaysia, Taiwan, you know, lower cost settings. We want them and need them to build them in America, hiring Americans to make this stuff on our shores. Um, and by the way, yes, we, we hope that once Congress does its job and gets us the money, we, uh, we hope, you know, Samsung, TSMC, c companies that are not American but in allied countries uh, will be eligible if they put their facility in the United States of America. And just one more question about that. I mean, do you think companies really get it that the supply chain, which was optimized for cost, needs to be optimized for other factors as well, like security? Yeah, I think they get it now. I think they get it now. As you say, so well said by you, I mean, there's been an obsession for decades with just in time, you know, obsession with efficiency. And we're realizing that in a world of severe climate change events where storms can take out a manufacturing facility or pandemics or other kind of disruptions, you need redundancy, you need resilience. Quite frankly, you need stuff near you and near your customers, not all of it in Asia. So I think that absolutely, they, they've learned a very painful lesson. I mean, if you talk to folks who run auto companies or trucking companies, it's been a really brutal year. I mean, like I said, their production is down so significantly. They've had to lay off workers. They have whole facilities filled with half-built cars and trucks. They can't finish them just because they can't get chips. So yeah, it's been a huge wake-up call for the private sector around how to build in resiliency, redundancy, just in case um, to their supply chain. Does all that speak to a decline in globalism and you know you're the U.S. Commerce Secretary, and I don't know what your your thinking is on that. I mean, obviously you have China on your mind as well, yeah. And they're the political considerations that impact supply chain. So, what is your thinking on that? Yeah, I don't think it does. I mm -hmm. listen. I think globalism is and should be alive and well. We, in fact, you speak of China. I mean, the president's very clear on this. We have to work with our allies as we confront the threat and competition from China. And we have to actually do a better job of that, working with our allies in the Indo-Pacific, with our allies in Europe. That being said, um, look, we have, uh, the United States, over decades, has just watched our manufacturing base wither, I mean, quite literally, just wither. We've lost, I think, 30% of small and medium-sized manufacturers in America, gone out of business in the past few decades. So. You know, there is a balance. We need to work with our allies. These supply chains are enormously sophisticated and global, and they should be. I was in Malaysia at the end of last year, and I visited the uh, semiconductor packaging facility of an American company. It's sophisticated. It's huge. Thousands of Malaysians work there. That is a good thing, but we can't make nothing in America. You know, it's just we have to. It's the, the balance is out of whack. We've taken our eye off the ball. To be a strong, vibrant global power, we need a strong, vibrant advanced manufacturing uh, industry in the United States of America with the workforce who can do those jobs. And that's a, that is a critical element. Is it part of your mandate to work with those allies that you were talking about um, in terms of you know, countering China, for lack of a better phrase, or uh, competing with China. Is that part of what you do? A hundred percent. Yeah, that's why I went. Yeah. I was in Japan, I was in Malaysia, I was in Singapore, uh, just fortifying those relationships, 
I've spent time in Europe. We, I, we were able to resolve the steel and aluminum tariffs with Europe. Uh, that's critical. You know, we have to have stronger than ever relationships with countries all around the world who share our values, who believe in freedom, democracy, transparency, the rule of law. And so that is, uh, the president's been very clear with me, with his team, that when you say America is back, that's not a slogan, that's real. That means working with our allies in, in the way that you describe. You mentioned British steel tariffs. Isn't there something going on with that? Yes, recently? we... What's, what's going on? What's the latest with we, that? <laughs> we want to resolve them. You know, yeah. we were able to get that done last year with the EU. Uh, uh, I'm negotiating now with Japan. And we'd like to start negotiating with the UK also to, like, mend fences and see if we can find solutions. So that would be to reduce them or get rid of them? Uh, yes, yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. I, we have to negotiate the exact yeah. details, but yes. So similar to what we did with the EU, um, we changed the arrangement in a way that got rid of the tariffs for a certain amount of steel and aluminum, which is good for workers and good for our relationship. I want to shift gears and ask you about Omicron and the disruptions that that's causing. And I'm curious whether the business leaders that you talk to consider this to be a long-term problem, a short-term problem? How are they yeah. seeing things? It's a very, very good question. I think, look, everybody's done with COVID. <laughs> you know, everybody is willing to be done with it, ready to be done with it, excuse me. I think they see it as short-term. Um, recently, in fact, just this week, the, uh, I've been you know, doing a round of check-ins with business leaders beginning in the new year. Folks are beginning to say it feels like we are uh, peaking and going to start to come down the other side of the curve. It's anyone's guess how long it will take. Also, we're all hoping that there's not yet another variant. Um, but I think there's a general view of optimism that these vaccines really do work. Uh, we have to get everybody vaccinated. There is increasing frustration from everyone, including business leaders, like why people still won't get vaccinated. But I think there's a view it's, a, it's temporary. And the labor shortages, I know I should maybe be asking Marty Walsh this <laughs> question, but I'll ask you. How do you see those right now getting worse, getting better? And what are yeah. business leaders saying to you about that as well? Uh, getting better, but still, an, still a significant issue. I would say getting better, but still a real issue. Um, and the CDC reduced its quarantine guidance from 10 days to five days. Is that helping, do you think? I think so, yes, I think so. Okay. But still, folks got to get vaccinated. Right. I want to go back a little bit to inflation, Secretary Raimondo, and ask you, um, beyond chips, are there other factors and why is this difficult to address perhaps? Or what is the best way to address it besides the chip situation? Yeah. So, you know, obviously the, the primary um, lever with respect to inflation uh, is held by the Fed. You know, so Chairman Powell and his colleagues have their work cut out for them, and I, I, and I, you know, trust that they will do the right thing and use the tools in their toolbox to combat inflation. That being said, the president has been very clear with us, we have to use every tool in our toolbox to help the American people and reduce inflation. So some of that is getting all these supply chain disruptions behind us the ports. Congestion at the ports has been a huge issue. We've leaned into it. It is much better. You know, the shelves were full for Christmas. Uh, but, you know, we have to put that behind us. Anything that relates to supply, so again, back to Econ 101, supply of goods has to go up to meet demand so prices can come down. So whether that is the actions the president took around meat processing, uh, to increase supply, you know, of meat, whether that's chips, ports, uh, anything we're doing to increase the supply of goods will fundamentally help to dampen uh, inflation. Also, look, there are provisions in the President's Build Back Better um, package that will increase the labor supply. You asked about labor before. 
we have to get more folks into the workforce. Women will be able to get back to work if they have affordable child care, if they have affordable um, care for their elderly loved ones. Now, that's longer term. You know, Build Back Better is kind of investing now for the future. But the supply matter, supply side matters. We get more folks working. We got to uh, increase the supply of goods so prices come down. You sound like you're using a lot of your econ <laughs> knowledge from uh, yeah. undergraduate days. Were you an econ major? Yeah, I was I an econ right. yeah, major, right. yeah. yeah. Well, going back. Uh, uh, yeah, exactly. And sometimes they ask you, does any of this stuff, do you ever really use it in the real world? Yeah, well, well I, you do. I went on to study. Um, I wound up getting a doctorate, so I yes. I come back to it frequently in right. this job. Right, absolutely. Um, you talked about Build Back Better. Are you optimistic? I am. About it? I am optimistic. I am realistic. Mm -hmm. I am optimistic. It's going to get, it has to get done. It will get done. Um, it'll look different. Whatever the president signs, this is a prediction I'm <laughs> willing to make. The final bill the president signs, law he signs, will look different than what he proposed will look different than what came out of the House. But fundamentally, it will be transformative. It will make these investments in climate, in workforce, in bringing down health care costs that we need. And yes, I think it gets done. Can I ask you about broadband and expanding access to broadband? And you've kind of got two fronts there people in urban populations who can't yeah. afford it, don't have access, and then the rural populations where it's an abomination, quite frankly. Yeah. Um, where do you stand? I know that's part of your remit as well, right? It is. It is. That's a huge piece of business here at the Department of Commerce. The bipartisan infrastructure law sent um, tens of billions of dollars to the Department of Commerce. Our job is to use that to make sure every American has broadband, rural, tribal, urban. Mm -hmm. Um, you're exactly right. The issues are different. In urban areas, uh, it's less about access and more about affordability. I was the governor of Rhode Island. There's no rural Rhode Island. It's a very, it's urban. It's densely populated. There's fiber everywhere, but it's not affordable everywhere. So in those places, we have to work harder on affordability. Also on providing um, digital literacy to folks. In the rural areas and tribal areas, we have to lay fiber and we have to use other technologies. Right now, it's so heartbreaking, Andy, to spend time as I've done in rural America. Um, there is no broadband for miles, to, uh, to hundreds of miles, which means you, you can't work from home. You can't visit the doctor, you know, with telemedicine. Your kids can't have virtual school. You know, in tribal lands um, out west, teachers would literally drive worksheets once a week to their students so the kids could do the work on paper and then, you know, m mail it back or drive it back to the school. So anyway, yeah, we have to do it. We will do it. We'll do it in partnership with the providers. At the end of this mission, every single American ought to have high-speed, affordable broadband. I want to drill down on that point you just made about working with the providers, because, I mean, that's mm -hmm. always key mm -hmm. for you, the private yeah. sector. Mm -hmm. And you've got the cable companies, and then you've got things like Starlink. Yes. You know, yeah. with, with Elon. Yes. And are you working with all those? I mean, is, is Starlink for real, for instance? Uh, so I don't want to comment on any particular mm. company, mm -hmm. but I will say this. We want to be um, technology agnostic and company mm. agnostic. We want to work in partnership with the private sector to get the job done. And by the way, it may not be economical to lay fiber um, all the way through Alaska, for example. So we're going to have to embrace different technologies. But what I've said, I've spent a lot of time so far with service providers from the very biggest to the smallest. Um, we want to work with all of you. We're going to hold you accountable. We need price transparency. We need competition. Uh, and, you know, w w it's a balance. It is a balance. Yes, they, they will receive money from the government to do the right thing, but it better be affordable. You know, affordability is critical, and affordable isn't $100 a month. Uh, and as I said, transparency and competition. 
Also want to ask you about tech companies, big U.S. tech companies and their struggles with the EU and my understanding enlisting your help or, or asking for help from you. Yeah. Google, Facebook in particular, where does that stand? Yeah, so I think everybody recognizes that there is a need for um, changes in the way we regulate tech companies. Um, that being said, some of the provisions being uh, debated in the EU feel um, discriminatory. You know, they're specifically designed to only affect three or four companies in the United States of America. Mm. And that, mm. you know, like that doesn't feel right. And so what I'm saying is, yes, of course, update regulations, change regulations, be pro-competition, be pro-transparency, be pro-privacy, but don't just specifically take aim at f four companies in the world, and also just have an open ear to some of the legitimate concerns of uh, American and American business. Mm, that must be a tricky balance to strike. I mean, they're not just for ordinary companies, right? I mean, <laughs> exactly. they're, they're pretty remarkable with huge yes. amounts of power. And then there's people like Lena Khan who have very, perhaps different perspectives, perhaps, but certainly a, a mandate that would suggest that their power is maybe too large. Yeah. And so how do you factor that in? Yeah, and by the way, that's true. Mm -hmm. You know, the president's been very clear about this. Like, we are pro-competition. We do believe there is there's, there's, there's legislation working its way through the House and the Senate in America right now dealing with that. That being said, uh, some of the provisions of, of what the EU is considering um, is, you know, as I said, there's not taking into account some of the very real concerns related to cybersecurity uh, and privacy and security that American companies have and we're asking the EU to have an open ear to that. Right. What part of your portfolio are people not aware of, Secretary Romando? <laughs> yeah. uh, it's a big portfolio. Maybe everything we have to do with oceans and climate. Hmm. So 40% of the Commerce Department is um, related to the ocean and the atmosphere. 40%? It, yeah, it's big. It's a big piece of business, what we do here. And that's all, of course, related to climate. So I spend a fair bit of my time. I was the governor of the Ocean State in Rhode Island. The Ocean I State, that's Ocean right. Ocean State, I love yeah. this. I really love it. See it on the license plates? You see, exactly, right. it's Ocean State. I grew up going to the beach. I grew up clamming. I, I feel we have to preserve the treasure of our coastal lands and our oceans. So in any event, I think people probably don't realize how much the Department of Commerce has to do with resiliency, climate, oceans, um, undersea uh, efforts. You talk about being governor of Rhode Island. How is this job different from that job? Yeah, um, it's pretty different. You know, Rhode Island's a small place and you can make things happen quickly when you're the governor. So this is obviously, um, you know, just the building where we're sitting is gigantic and we have almost 60,000 employees just in the Commerce Department. So I'd, I'd say that is different. In many ways, though, leadership is leadership. You know, you set, you set a vision, you manage your team, you drive to results. Uh, so those, in that way, it's, it's very familiar. Working with the legislature is also very familiar for me. Right. I enjoy it. I like it. It's part of the job. I did that as governor. I'm doing that here. Right. When you were governor of Rhode Island, you were out front back then saying that schools should stay open. I know you're not education secretary, but what are your thoughts on what's going on with our schools right now with the yeah. pandemic? Uh, I still feel kids need to be in school. You know, uh, these vaccines are safe. There has to be safety. Obviously, we have to keep our teachers safe and our kids safe, no doubt about it. That means good protocols, more testing, everyone has to be vaccinated. Um, but with those precautions, kids ought to be in school. The, I, I really believe 20, 30 years from now, when we look back, or maybe even 10 years from now, when we look back at COVID and we look at 
what are all the lasting negative impacts, the biggest one will be um, what happened to our kids, the mental health issues, how they have fallen behind in their education. And of course, this will just, this again will contribute to the lack of equity in America because it'll be the children who didn't have broadband, whose parents couldn't stay home to teach them, who were already a little bit behind, who are just so much further behind. So I'm, uh, I have religion on this topic. I also have two teenagers and I see it. We gotta get kids in school. There is a recent article out there uh, talking about your future and being a bright light in the Democratic Party. I wonder what your ambitions are, Secretary Raimondo. Um, to get through the week. <laughs> I mean, like, I have a big, 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 big job here. We just touched on it. So this is what I'm focused on. All right, and finally, a sort of related question, but a little different, I hope, is mm -hmm. what do you see as your legacy here and maybe personally? Gosh, uh, wow. Uh, here, I, I think this, the broadband that we talked about will, will be, uh, if I do it right, my legacy. It, this is fundamental. You know, this, is, this, this done properly, uh, it will be comparable to any of the biggest infrastructure implementations in our nation's history. And as I look towards, like, the economy and the, the digital divide, and how that plays into the economic and opportunity divide. Uh, there's a huge sense of urgency around getting broadband to everyone. So um, I think in this job, that'll be a big portion of it. Focus on that. Yeah. All right. U.S. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. You've been watching Influencers. I'm Andy Serwer. We'll see you next time.